So I, I apologize that I cannot tell you in Norwegian how honored I am to be here. Um, I hope this is not a complete disaster. This is my first time to use such technology partially. So let's start with um, early history. Um, although I met Hendrik um, 43 years ago, we'll go back 373 years, um, where Fermat um, wonders about um, whether minus one is a square mod p. Then we skip 100 years, and Euler is quite systematic about whether anything is a square mod p. Um, then we skip a while again. Legendre formulates quadratic reciprocity, although he never manages to prove it. Um, the so-called last entry in Gauss's diary, which was the last entry, um, he counts the number of solutions um, mod p of this so-called lemniscate equation. Um, he says it's by induction, and it's only um, in 1920 or so, both Artin and uh, Herglotz make it rigorous, what he said. But this um, lemniscate is also studied by Abel. Whoops. Yeah, OK. And then the next um, step in our story, in 1830, Galois invents finite fields that aren't prime fields. And um, they'll play a, a big role in the story that's coming. Um, a little, a relatively little known mathematician named Libri um, counted the mod p solutions of both of these equations. Um, Libri, as his name suggests, had an affinity for books. In fact, he was um, somewhat light fingered. Okay, now we'll have the sort of um, more semi modern story. Um, oh. Yeah. So, Curves over finite fields are seen, so to speak, in the German school as analogs of number fields. And Artin, um, in his thesis, defines the zeta function of a curve over a finite field and formulates the Riemann hypothesis. And some years later, F.K. Schmidt finds the, um, proves the correct shape for zeta function of curves. So let me um, remind you, well, if we have any variety over a finite field, the, um, these finite fields have extensions one of each degree. And if we take the points, the solutions of the equations there, and we count how many there are, then this sequence of numbers is some kind of diophantine skeleton of this variety. And um, what the, it turned out that the good way to assemble this data is to take the sum n greater than or equal to 1 of these numbers, multiply it by t to the n over n, and exponentiate the whole thing. So this was not the way it originally appears in, in Artin or in F.K. Schmidt, there they're thinking about um, the function field of this curve. Um, for them, um, they talk about effective divisors, and they, they write an additive expression for this, which I won't go into. So this, um, this is the zeta function of an x naught over F.Q. It's a as defined here, it's a formal power series in, in the variable t. And what, um, what F.K. Schmidt proves in the curve case is that it's a polynomial of degree 2g with a very simple denominator, 1 minus t times 1 minus qt. And this polynomial has some internal symmetry. Um, if we write this polynomial as a product 1 minus alpha i times t, it's a polynomial with constant term 1, then um, alpha to q over alpha is a bijection on these roots. So it's kind of a functional equation. And what will be important will be understood to be important very soon, 
is that if you have a complex curve, then 2g is the dimension of its h upper 1. And here I have the dimension, the degree of this is dimension of h0. The degree of this is dimension of h upper 2. And the Riemann hypothesis that um, Emil Artin formulates in, in this curve case, it's a statement that these alpha i's have absolute value the square root of q. OK. So here's a picture of Artin. And um, meanwhile, there's, there's a kind of parallel development that um, both Davenport and Mordell, which I, I guess are on the next slide here, um, they're thinking um, from some point of view less conceptually. They're writing down equations, and they just want to count the number of solutions of them. And the Davenport one is kind of interesting because in, in, so for both of these equations, you guess that the number of points on, on the curve like this is about p. So it's p plus something. And the something is your error term. And um, in, in lots of interesting applications, um, you want the error term to be um, a lower power of p than p to the 1. And um, in this sort of British school, they work p to the 5 6, p to the 3 quarters, p to the 2 thirds, whatever. And um, the ideal error term was um, that it would be a constant times the square root of p. And uh, strangely enough, it, it took a, a little while for, um, for it to be realized that having the error term root p was exactly the same as this Riemann hypothesis statement. Um, it wasn't obvious right away. And um, here's a picture of Davenport. OK. So um, then in, in the early 30s, Haas approves the Riemann hypothesis for um, curves, over, curves of genus 1 over finite fields. Um, there had been some teasing between uh, Haas and Davenport. Haas would tease Davenport that he was just reducing exponents. And Davenport's response was, well, if you're so conceptual, why don't you do something about it? And apparently, this provoked Tassa to try and prove the Riemann hypothesis for elliptic curves. OK. So the next thing that happens, and here's Hasse talking to Artin, if you wondered what these people look like. Um, so then in 1948, they proves the Riemann hypothesis for curves of arbitrary genus. And um, he. Here's Andre Vey as a young man. And he formulates um, the Vey conjectures. And um, so there are four parts to these Vey conjectures. So let me just explain very briefly what they are. So as he formulates it, he has an x0 over fq, which is projective, smooth, and geometrically connected. So I've already told you what zeta is in general. Okay. And the first conjecture, this rationality conjecture, is its zeta function. So let's say this, this has some dimension n. Okay. So it's going to be a rational function. It's going to be a product of polynomials. Upstairs, you'll have p1, p3, up to p2n minus 1. Downstairs, you'll have p0, p2, up to p2n. And you're, you're supposed to have that this one, this one is supposed to be 1 minus t. This one is supposed to be 1 minus q to the n t, n being this dimension. Um, and it, that, that's sort of all you're told right away. Okay? And each of these pi's, you write as some product 1 minus alpha i j t. So you have these so-called reciprocal roots. And um, this duality statement is the statement that 
when you take alpha to q to the n over alpha, then what you're redoing is you're interchanging the roots of pi with the roots of p 2n minus i. And this, um, this is supposed to make you think of Poincare duality. And then this um, comparison statement is um, that if this x0, let's say over fp to fix ideas, just so you'll understand the statement, if this is a reduction mod p of a nice, I don't know, bold x, so to speak, well, over the complex numbers, but so to speak, over the integers, um, then he says that the degree of this ith polynomial in the zeta function is supposed to be the ith Betty number of the complex points of C, of, of x, rather. And finally, the, this, the Riemann hypothesis statement is that when you take, so this, these are from pi, these are these reciprocal roots from pi, here the absolute values are supposed to be root q to the i. Okay. And um, I mean, if you like, the whole, the whole theme of the story I'm telling you is how um, Ideas from the complex numbers alter and illuminate the situation over finite fields. And I, I guess the next lecture is going to reverse that implication. <laughs> um, OK. So what happens next is um, in the early 1960s, um, Grotendieck and a number of collaborators, but particularly Mike Harton, developed um, Atlantic cohomology, which attaches to, if you have a separated scheme of finite type over an algebraically closed field, you can talk about its ordinary cohomology groups and its compact cohomology groups with QL adic coefficients. And Here's Grotendieck. Here's a Mike Arton. These HI and HI compact are going to have all, and any sort of standard property you ever learned in a topology course about cohomology or cohomology with compact support. It's going to be true for these things. The new, well, one important new feature is that, as, as we learned earlier today, um, if you start with a variety over a finite field, when you extend its scalars, to what, what Pierre called bold F, the algebraic closure, you have this Galois action. Now, the Galois group of a finite field has, well, what we learn in, in um, baby classes is that it has a canonical generator which is raising to the qth power. And the inverse of that canonical generator um, is somehow the relevant one here, and we'll call it Frobenius sub Q. Frobenius sub Q operates on all these cohomology groups. And the, um, this Lefschetz trace formula says that it says that you can count the number of FQ points by taking the alternating sum of the traces of this Frobenius on the compact cohomology groups. And if you want the number of points over fq to the n, then you should take the nth power of that Frobenius sub q and take the alternating sum of its traces. And what that means is, uh, is equivalent to that zeta is going to have an expression like this, where pi now is going to be the determinant of 1 minus t times Frobenius sub q on hi compact. Uh, so for any variety, you're going to have this kind of expression, maybe without this part being correct, 
We can have some kind of expression like this. It's certainly going to be a rational function. That was, in fact, already known. Um, and um, so you at least have some, some initial control of um, the zeta function from this, from this cohomology. Now, um, there's something even better that's going on. Um, well, there, there are many better things. Let's erase all this. So an immediate, if you like, challenge or, or test of the suitability of, of this theory is, well, let's leave him on the board. What happens, OK, I, I told you slightly. I said that it attached cohomology groups with all the good properties to a variety over an algebraically closed field. Strictly speaking, if you use l adic cohomology, you need to only consider algebraically closed field whose characteristic isn't L. OK. Now, suppose we, take, we took a variety over the complex numbers. So that's an algebraically closed field. So we have these HI or HI compact of this X, this etal cohomology. And the question is, what does this have to do with the usual, usual story? What does it have to do with HI or HI compact of the complex points thought of as a topological space with rational coefficients? And the answer is, it's a wonderful theorem, that you get this from these by just tensoring them over Q with QL. So that's good. We've, so to speak, recreated usual, the usual story over the complex numbers, except that we've somehow had to extend scalars a little bit. And then um, there's this other important fact. So in usual topology, there's the notion of a local system, a local coefficient system. It's introduced by Steenrod in, I think, 1944 in a paper called Homology with Local Coefficients. And um, the picture is, in, in the, um, suppose we have, say, a proper smooth morphism. So in the complex case, we would know, let's call this F, that if we take the cohomology along the fiber, say, with rational coefficients, that this is the quintessential example of a local system on S. It means that at each point of S, you have HI of the fiber. And as you move the point around, the HIs of these fibers are isomorphic to each other. So what happens in this arithmetic story is um, suppose we have a proper smooth morphism. And suppose S um, is a scheme where L is invertible. So we can do this. So let's suppose that this is just a scheme over z1 over l. Fine. Then I put an l here so that now I can have a purely algebraic discussion. And one of the th fundamental theorems is that this is still a local system now in some etal sense. And in particular, let's imagine that I have my x over z with some some set of bad primes. So project a smooth variety defined with rational coefficients, and then you spread it out. So according to this, it's going to be a local system here. So on the one hand, we can map this to fp bar, and we'll get in characteristic p, so to speak, the geometric fiber. On the other hand, we can map this to the complex numbers. And this local system statement is that the cohomology of this fiber is, by some choice of path from here to here, isomorphic to the cohomology of this fiber. 
And the cohomology of this fiber, we already said, was the same as the, so to speak, topological cohomology tensored with QL. So it means that this um, comparison part of the Bay conjectures is OK. If, if the thing is a reduction from characteristic 0, these, these PIs in, produced by this theory will have the right um, Okay, let's see if that works better. All right, now somewhere, where's the sponge? Okay, so yeah, thank you. OK, so now imagine that we're interested, maybe we started with some proper smooth morphism, but over an S now, maybe I'll call it S0, which is over FQ. Okay. And somehow I've created an l -adic local system on S0. So one way to think of this this means it's a representation of the pi 1 of this S0, and I'm failing to specify a base point. Now, in this pi 1, I have every time, so let me make a, a here, here's my picture of S0. I, if I take an, an extension of FQ and a point with values in FQ, a point with that, values in that extension, so I, here I take some extension and some point S, which is a point with values there, I get an element, a conjugacy class, strictly speaking, in this group. And the, there's a Lefschetz trace formula which says that if I take the sum over the points over some FQN, and for each, I take the trace of this Frobenius element, so to speak, in the representation which this f is, that that sum of traces is the alternating sum of traces now of Frobenius sub q on the compact cohomology of what I'll call s, that's s naught with its scalars extended, that thing with coefficients in f, which by this general principle that was explained earlier today, um, this Frobenius is going to operate on this object. OK. And um, if I won't do it, but you could, you could make, you could talk about the L function with coefficients in this f, and then you would be saying that it has some kind of formula of reverse characteristic polynomials on these. And this should be compact cohomology. OK. So. Um, This, this is going to turn out to be good in a second because it almost proves the first three of the Vey conjectures. It, it gives this a formula like this. Um, the theory has Poincare duality. If we have a, 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 a lifting to characteristic zero, we're going to have the right compatibility. Um, but there are some problems. And the, the sort of most obvious problem is that when in this whole discussion, if I'm in characteristic P, I pick some prime L that's not P, and I work with this l -adic theory. Well, if I work with the l -adic theory, then um, these polynomials are l -adic polynomials. And maybe they're not always the same polynomials if I use different Ls. And um, 
another problem. I'm supposed to prove something about the absolute values of, they disappeared, here. I'm supposed to prove something about the absolute values of these reciprocal roots. So these, these, these are roots of some allotic polynomial. They live in QL bar. What sense can it make to talk about their complex absolute values? This seems pretty serious, and you know, what could you possibly do? OK. So Deline cuts the Gordian knot. And fortunately, there was a reporter on the scene. <laughs> and OK, so let me explain to you um, how he cuts this knot. OK, so, so where are these eigenvalues? They're in QL bar, an algebraic closure of QL. So he says, OK, just embed this field into the complex numbers. Just do it. Well, just choose an iota. I mean, if you're not afraid of the axiom of choice, such things exist. And then you can talk about the iota absolute values of these numbers. Right, so that seems, well, it's a definition, but it's, it's certainly not clear it's going to lead to anything. OK. So, and then we make a definition. Um, and the definition is that this, this f, this local system on our, on our S0, is iota pure of some way w. The essential case is w equals 0, but let's just say it anyway. Um, if you take an eigenvalue of a Frobenius sub so fqn comma s acting on f, you apply iota to it. Now you have a complex number. And what you're supposed to get is the square root of the relevant q, which would here be qn raised to the power w. Okay? So if this w equals 0 means that all these eigenvalues thought of as complex numbers lie on the unit circle. OK, so that's a definition. And the next thing that happens in this, in this story is that, and this is kind of the, the, the key step in um, Deline's V1 paper, he gives an a priori criterion that if it's satisfied by what he calls an iota real local system. An iota real means that all these traces, when you view them under iota as complex numbers, are in fact real numbers. a um, criterion that says if, if you have something that's iota real and some good things happen, then in fact it's iota pure of known, known weight. And that's really the key step in um, his proving the Riemann hypothesis part of the Bay conjectures in the Bay 1 paper. And as he says there, it's inspired by reading Rankin's 1938 paper on tau of n, and also key is thinking about Zariski closures of monodromy groups, which involves, of course, the whole theory of Lie groups and classification and everything, which gives us the opportunity to show you Sophus Lee, who looks pretty serious there. OK. And then um, what comes next in the they two paper, the um, if you like the main theorem of the they two paper is that if we look at H i compact of this S with coefficients in an F, so 
so to speak, in V1, we, we found a way to know that a local system is iota pure of some weight. So now let's suppose that this guy, for instance, is iota pure of weight 0. Okay? And let's look at HI compact, which has a Frobenius sub Q operating on it. And we can say, OK, well, what are the absolute values of the eigenvalues of this action? And although Pierre said he didn't like inequalities, nonetheless, he's, he's forced to settle for proving an inequality. Namely, this is less than or equal to root Q to the power i if we're on HI compact, and here we're weight 0 inside. In general, the weights, so to speak, add in this story. And there's a, a, um, an extra little goodie which is important um, in certain kinds of applications. So let me just say it. So in this, in this story so far, this S0 that I started with, so it's some separated scheme of finite type over FQ. It could be absolutely anything. It could be really quite distressingly unpleasant. But if if this S0 over FQ is itself, say, smooth and geometrically connected, okay, then, and say of dimension, I don't know, d, then on this H2d compact, which is the highest one there could be, the absolute value of any eigenvalue is equal to root q to the 2n, also known as q to the n. So we know exactly what the biggest eigenvalue is and where it occurs. And every other eigenvalue in any, in any lower cohomology group is smaller. So what can we do with this? How, how is it applied? OK. So although Deline's already proven the Bay conjecture, the Riemann hypothesis part of Bay conjectures in V1, if you apply this statement, if you take for your S0 over FQ the original projective smooth variety you were playing with, now you may say, well, gee, I don't know what a local system is. But the constant sheaf is a local system. So this theorem applied, and for the, uh, uh, this projective thing, compact and ordinary cohomology are the same. So you get an inequality on these eigenvalues. On the other hand, we have this Poincare duality business with alpha to Q to the n over alpha. So if you have inequalities for both the alphas and the q to the n over alphas, then there have to be equalities. So you've given, so to speak, a second proof of this, this Riemann hypothesis part. And now your proof works for proper smooth things. Whereas the original proof, it was intrinsically projective. It used Lefschetz pencils. It, it, it didn't make sense. Um, you couldn't do anything in that approach for, for a proper thing. OK. Um, then there are all kinds of um, equidistribution results. So let me just say in words how they come about. So in a, a maybe not completely elementary course on number theory, you learn Dirichlet's theorem on primes in arithmetic progression. And you know that if you want to prove that um, primes in, um, say, modulo capital N are equidistributed among all the things they could be, then what you have to prove, or the way, in fact, what theoretically proves, you have to prove that L1 chi is non-zero, and the chi being a, a, a mod N character. So, but the, the, um, the important thing there so let's, let's draw the L1 chi picture. Here's real part of S equals 1. Okay. And you need to know that your L function isn't 0 along here. Now, in fact, the, the, what, if we knew the, Riemann hypothesis, the usual Riemann hypothesis for L functions, we would know that not only is not 0 here, in fact, the first zeros are down here. And what this tells us is in doing equidistribution questions, you're completely safe because 
as long as you don't have something trivial which makes this, the next zeros are at least a half an inch away. That's how it gets used. Okay, and so that's one kind of um, application. Another kind of application is um, in analytic number theory, um, you often have a sum, typically just over FP points of something, um, some smooth thing of some dimension d, um, which ballpark would have, um, say over FP, it had p to the d points, so you'd have p to the d terms. And the ideal thing that those people are very happy if they can have is an estimate for this, this thing with p to the d terms that it's some simple constant times the square root of p to the d. That's called square root cancellation. It's, it's the best you could hope for. And um, th there's a technology um, in terms of this, if, if your S0 over FQ is not only, if it's both affine and smooth, and the HI compact, and so we have an RF here, if our HI compact maps isomorphically to our HI, then only this H, let's call it D compact, is non-zero, and even here all the eigenvalues are root Q or root P, whatever, to the D. So it's the ideal situation. And again, the way to think about this question, is this map from compact cohomology to ordinary cohomology an isomorphism? Well, this is just a topological question. If you know your input local system is pure, you can forget how you knew it. You, don't, you just have to play with it as a topological object, and you can try and see if this works. And if it does, you're golden from the point of view of square root cancellation. Now, um, so what are some square root cancellation applications? So a, a few that um, sort of came to mind. So Heath Brown had proven um, that if you have over Q, a cubic form in 10 variables that's non-singular as, as a form over Q, then it has a non-trivial non solution. And that was down from something like 16 variables before. So it involves lots of hard stuff. But one of the key inputs um, is a square root cancellation estimate for some sums. Um, then Hooley went one more. He did nine variables. Um, so his nine variable um, cubic form, it had to be non-singular, and it also had to have the property, which was automatic for 10 or more variables, that everywhere locally, it had a non-trivial solution. Okay? And then just recently, um, using work of Bombieri and Birch, which um, was doing some square root cancellation work, and earlier things done by Friedland and Ivaniak, and Goldston, Pence, and Yulderim, a man named Yitang Zhang, has proven um, that there are bounded gaps between primes. There are infinitely many pairs of primes within 70 million of each other, which it's not two, but it's a start, and it's the first result of that type. And um, to conclude my lecture, I'll just mention um, <coughs> Deleen with Bernstein, Valenson, and Gaber. Um, transposes the Goresme McPherson theory of perverse sheaves um, into the Aladdin context. Again, it's taking some, an idea from characteristic zero, and it turns out to, in some sense, be a, the best generalization of local systems. Um, it act, interacts very well with Fourier transform, also transposed from characteristic zero. And finally, if you didn't think that was enough, we have Glean Mumford approach to moduli problems. I mean, so the actual result was about compactifying the moduli space of curves, but the effect was to completely change forever the way people approach moduli problems. Um, we have his construction of the allotic representation attached to modular forms, and all 
sort of all work since then in about Sato Tate, about potential modularity, whatever. It always is taking place in that context. You have some melodic representation, you want to prove it is attached to a modular form, but that's the language it's taking place in. There's Dulin Lustig, where they give the representation theory of finite simple groups of Lie type, which in that subject it sort of completely changed things and opened it up. And on that note, I will end and maybe we'll have some questions. <laughs> Thank you.